Okay, I will begin. I'll begin this morning's uh, Dharma talk. And as I promised last night, I will give the talk on the jhanas. This is how, what I encourage you to experience. And it's helpful to know uh, some description of the experiences of the jhana. I've already gone into great detail uh, on the path uh, by which one enters those jhanas. Uh, especially the path of the nimitta. Before somebody asked me the question, is there another way to enter the jhana other than through the nimitta? And the answer is yes, there is. But the nimitta path is a much clearer, a more well-defined, easier path to use. Basically, you know where you are and it's easier to make sure that what you experience is a jhana, easier to make that entrance into the jhanas. <coughs> but it is true that not everybody experiences the nimitta as a visual object. I already mentioned to you that what you're experiencing when you see a nimitta is not a physical light. Your sense of sight has shut down quite a long time ago you are seeing a mental object. It is uh, the reflection of your jitta. And the jitta is not seen through the eye. It is seen uh, by itself. The jitta seeing the jitta, the mind seeing the mind. But because the jitta, the mind, is not well experienced by human beings, because people don't know it very well, we don't have much of a language to describe it. And the way that perception works, which is how we understand things, is we have an experience, like we're seeing the jitta for the first time. And the perception compares that experience to something similar, to the closest experience it's had in the outside world. And because human beings are very visual <coughs> beings, we spend more of our brain on seeing than we do on any other object of the senses. Because of that, we are very, uh, have lots and lots and lots of perceptions about uh, sight, about vision. And because of that, when the jitta appears, the vast majority of people see the jitta, experience it, perceive it as a light. It is not a light, it is a mental object. And for that reason, as I said last night in the answer to the question, you don't need to wear a pair of sunglasses when that nimitta becomes very bright. You can let it be as bright as it wants. It will not affect your eyes, it will not affect your mind or your brain, except to give it more power and more joy. And I've mentioned my own personal experiences with nimittas, that sometimes they're just so incredibly bright you think you can't stand it. I understand that question which somebody said, because I've had that experience many times myself. But the confidence and wisdom which surround this whole process means you can take even more. And you don't get blinded, but just you get into jhanas. So, do not be afraid of the brightness. It is not a visual object, it's a mental object. It is a reflection of that uh, mental object. And sometimes you experience that mental object, a few people, just as almost like a tactile sensation. as just joy and bliss. And you can use that to get into jhanas, but uh, for my experience as a teacher, as a meditator, I don't recommend that. I recommend you to try and develop the visual type nimitta, the nimitta which does appear as a light, because it is much more useful and easier to get into jhana that way. And it does not matter what colour it is, what shape it is, for those of you who uh, have read some of the instructions even with Sudhimagga about expanding the nimitta, decreasing it, please don't worry about that instruction. Because if you put your attention to the size, you're actually putting your attention to the edge of the nimitta. 
you know, that space between the brightness and what's outside of it. And that gives too much of a disturbance. Instead of seeing one thing, you're seeing two things, the inside and outside, which will define its size and shape. Please never be concerned about anything to do with the edge or outside the nimitta. Don't care whether it's a sharp shape or a fuzzy shape. Always go to the center of that nimitta, the middle part, where there is no edges, where there is no size. You're trying to simplify your perception as much as possible to get to a point of singleness of perception. As I mentioned early on in these talks, that when your perception of one thing is stable and still, when things don't move, they disappear. I mention that with simple things like the sound of the fan or the, or the experience of your saliva in your mouth or the experience deeper on in meditation of your body disappearing because nothing's happening there, things turn off. They disappear, they vanish. And this is what happens with nimittas. When it's very still, stable and bright, it vanishes. That's usually experienced by a person falling into the nimitta, or the nimitta enveloping you. But afterwards, it's gone. It's done its job. And as long as that nimitta was stable, reasonably stable, that where you enter that, uh, the first jhana, that will also be stable. However, what usually happens the first time is that one enters the middle of the nimitta or into the jhana and one bounces out again. Simply that one cannot let things go, it's exciting, it's powerful, sometimes it's scary. Those last upakalesas stop you entering and staying in the jhana. Uh, using uh, similes from our modern life, I call that ping-pong jhana. Ping-pong jhana because you have table tennis, you bounce the ball, it goes down and up again. It never stays on the table. So that's like ping-pong jhana, which is most people's first experience of jhana. They just go in and they come out and wow, that was really something, but it didn't last long enough. And so the skill has to be to enter and stay. And how is that skill developed? It's just developed on the nimitta, the skill of just leaving things alone, overcoming fear and excitement with the nimitta. So the next time fear and excitement comes up with the entry to the jhana, you can handle it and pass the test. I did give another simile which is very accurate to the path of meditation. At every stage you're given a test. And if you pass the test you can go deeper. And the test gets harder and harder and harder the deeper you get. And the tests of the nimitta and jhana stage <coughs> are the test to really be able to let go so much that there is no fear, there is no excitement, there is no control, there is the heroic energy to abandon everything, like the warrior in battle gives their very life, every limb, every part of their body, for the cause. They can surrender everything. Now that's the sort of energy which one needs at that stage. It's the energy to totally let go and abandon and even know you're afraid. Or you could be afraid because you haven't got much of a clue where you're going. You're going to uncharted territory, places you've never been before, experiences which are very different than anything you have known. Of course, it can be scary. But hopefully you have enough faith in the teachings of the Buddha. Hopefully monks like myself and others who teach jhana have encouraged you about the worth of attaining those jhanas, their value, their importance, so that your courage and your commitment to the truth, so I'm going to find out no matter what it costs me, is going to be enough for you to enter those jhanas. So the fear and excitement doesn't arise. It seems from when people have told me that the biggest of those upikalesas at the entrance to jhana is the excitement. 
because many of you have been practicing for years. Many of you, even before you became monks, you know, heard about the teachings of the Buddha and heard about such things like jhanas and heard about their great power. And now you're very close, you're about to experience it yourself. You're about to get one of the great prizes of the holy life, a jhana experience. And it should not be underestimated how powerful and how wonderful that is. You're about to win the religious lottery. And of course, you get excited. Many people have told me that when lay people, when they're reading out the lottery numbers, the first number, yeah, I've got that. The second number, yes. The third, yes. And they get very excited. Only one more number to go. And they're so, so excited. And that number doesn't come up. But you can see the excitement which comes when you're about to win something very big, and that's only money. Imagine this jhanas. There's incredible excitement. Can happen if you're not careful. And that is a cause for the ping pong in the jhana. You go in and you go out again. But don't worry, you've tasted something, and it'll leave an impression in your mind that this is important, this is valuable. This is an essential part of the holy life. And once you've tasted it for the first time, you'll have to try and get back again. It will draw you in. You have to. There's no other choice to it. The mind has tasted something brilliant. I mentioned the other day that the Buddha described the experience of the jhana as nekamasukha, the happiness of renunciation. If you look in those explanations in such places as the I think uh, Malunkya Puta Sutta, 64 Majjhima Nikaya, you'll also find that he also described it as Sambodhi Sukha. And when I read that, I thought, my goodness, that is impressive and powerful, because Sambodhi means enlightenment. He said this is enlightenment happiness. And that made sort of the hairs on the back of my neck, as they say in the West, go up. It gave me the shivers of excitement. You're tasting enlightenment, happiness. And we all know, because we know enough about the Dhamma, to know that is not enlightenment. It is not Magapala. But the Buddha, in his wisdom, realized the power of those jhanas to say that it's so close to the experience of enlightenment to give it that powerful name of Sambodhi Sukha. Close enough to know what enlightenment feels like. So you're getting to very, very high, powerful, sublime states of mind. So no wonder there'll be barriers like excitement or fear. Having warned you, it's less likely those will come up. You'll be expecting them, which means that you'll program your mindfulness. And actually, you don't program your mindfulness, I've done it for you. <laughs> which means that you'll be on the lookout for those things. And it's a strange thing with the mind. The deeper you get, the closer you get to these jhana states, the more effective that programming is. It's as if the mind is so subtle, these instructions which you give in now kick in, because there's no other thing to be done there. The mind has got no other reference points. Again, you're on strange territory. And those little teachings which you were given help you make that step into those jhanas. The other thing which draws you in, the thing which helped me a lot, was you're on the edge of those jhanas sometimes many times, powerful nimittas, and it's as if, this is only as if, this is not what happens, it's as if you can see just one more step and you're in the jhana. You know you're that close, you're on the edge. And there's a fear which comes up. This is too big for me, this is too much. Even though I want to become enlightened, I don't think I can handle this. It's too huge. But then, as you look in, it's so gorgeous and beautiful and, and radiant and happy. It is the pleasure which often overcomes that fear. I don't know if I could, but it looks so gorgeous and wonderful. I can't, but look at it. No, I'm going for it. <laughs> and it draws you in. 
never underestimate the place of this mental pleasure in the practice of meditation. It is an essential feature and it's got a purpose to it. It draws you in ever deeper and deeper and deeper. And in fact, I've often said that the holy life is very much can be described quite accurately as a pursuit of real happiness and an experience of even deeper and deeper happinesses. What the world says is suffering, the Aryans know as happiness. What the world says is happiness, the Aryans are not interested in that at all, that's suffering. You're finding out what real happiness is. As you get closer and closer to Nibbana, you all know that Nibbana was called by the Buddha Paramang Sukhang, the highest happiness. So the closer you get, the more that happiness increases. And sometimes the pursuit of happiness, otherwise known as the eradication of suffering, drives the meditator ever deeper. It's not you who does that driving, it's just the nature of your mind. You can't stop the mind searching for happiness. And I've mentioned this to Western monks, and I think the same might apply to Sinhalese monks as well. If you don't get happiness in your meditation, if that doesn't satisfy you and bring joy, your mind, your mind will always go out for the sensory pleasures. The mind, despite all of your efforts to control it, will go to where it wants to find happiness. Your mind is out of control. You should know that, because there is no self inside to control it. It is an automatic process. It's only when it perceives and tastes and experiences the happiness of the jhana that the holy life is secure. I think that's in the Sandaka Sutta, where the Buddha was telling Ananda the consolations of the holy life. And the first consolation of the holy life, the first thing which makes it worthwhile, is the experience of jhana. Look at that one, it's a powerful sutta. Without the jhana, you'll be struggling and struggling. And as Westerners, you may even leave and disrobe and go and search for something else. It's much harder in Sri Lanka because you're not expected to disrobe. You're going to endure for the rest of your life. But I won't and everybody else out of compassion wants you to have a happy monastic life. So develop those jhanas. Not only will you have a happy monastic life, you'll never ever think of disrobing. You never want to disrobe. The mind is just so happy getting these jhanas. You get some consolation. That's the first consolation. Obviously the greater consolations are so on, Sakadagami, Anagami, Arahat. But that's the first consolation of the holy life. So soon, it happens. Soon the mind goes and seeks that happiness. You're so close and it knows where that happiness is and it enters the jhana. And what actually happens when you experience that jhana? For the first time that you experience the jhana, you'll be there for a long time. You're not sure how long, usually half an hour minimum. I'm only just saying this from experience, usually much longer than that, because these are very stable, very peaceful, having such a wonderful time. Of course, why should you come out? There's no reason to come out. You're having the best state of happiness and bliss in your life. It is profound bliss. It is very sustaining and uh, very enjoyable and very profound. And the mind will not come out even if you want it, to. well actually you can't want it to, but it just stays there for long periods of time. And when you come out afterwards, you will know that something huge has happened, an experience very different than anything you've known before. The jhanas are magnificent, huge, something big has happened. Then you have to look back and find out what. Because within the jhana, you can't think. You can't explore and say, is this factor present, is that factor present? The jhanas are deep states of stillness. Even in nimitta, if you start thinking, you destroy the nimitta. In a jhana, it is so still and stable, all jhanas, that the mind can't move. 
He can't move backwards and forwards to find out what a thing is. An example of that, which is it's very tough to get examples of jhana, simply because they're so different to normal experiences, it's hard to find similes. And if you experience those jhanas, and then you go and see how the Buddha described it, you just bow down with tears in your eyes at the brilliance of a Buddha, not only having experienced those states, but being able to describe them just so powerfully, accurately. The brilliance of a Buddha is not just his experience, his ability to convey that experience to others in perfect language, using similes which when you achieve those jhanas, you respect enormously. He truly was the great teacher, the greatest teacher. But when you go into those states and you try and describe, you know how hard it is. And one little description, because I remember as a kid, watching the TV, sometimes there were the, these quiz shows on TV. And they were usually leaving a question for the audience, which was, you know, the people watching the TV show, and you could write or phone in afterwards your answer to see who got it correctly. And what it was, it was a photograph of a well-known object but seen from a strange angle. And you were asked to guess what that object was. And I remember one object, it had a dot in the middle and then a circle around it, and that was it. And they asked what it was. And it was very difficult to find out. And the answer was, it was a pencil. But it was photographed just with the tip in the middle and the wood around it. It was from such a strange angle that hardly anyone could guess what it is. And I remember that because to know something, you look at it from this angle, that angle, this angle, that angle, you have to look at it from many different perspectives to understand what it is. Just like a key, if I held this key up so you could not see much of it except along its spine, you wouldn't really be able to know what it was. But when you move it backwards and forwards, you can understand it. A lot of comprehension needs many different perspectives added together to find out what that object is. The trouble with jhana, you've only got one perspective. It's like a single perception which lasts a huge length of time. It has not got any space to move backwards and forwards to understand what that object is. So within the jhana, you don't know where you are, perfectly mindful, perfectly still. But within a jhana, it's impossible to know whether it's first, second, third, fourth, arupas or whatever. What happens is when you emerge from the jhana. After you've emerged from the jhana with such a strong experience that you can look back upon it, you can recall it as an object. And once you recall that as an object, then you can move backwards and forwards and you can examine it. In Pali it's called Pachawekanayana, sometimes translated in English as reviewing consciousness or reviewing knowledge. You've had a big experience and it leaves a very, very, very strong impression in the mind. It's very easy to recall. The stronger the experience is, the more they're imprinted on your memory, and it's so easy to recall that jhana. And then you examine what it was. If you are in an experience, and you think, is this first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, or fourth jhana? It's no jhana at all. If you can say those words, your mind is not still. It's not a jhana. You have to be that still. That is called ekagata a single peak of the mind. Singleness means you can't have the two perspectives to understand what is happening there. That is the experience of the jhana. There's no duality in the sense you can compare things. It's just a oneness of the mind, a singleness of the mind, which gives it the strange characteristic of being unknowable in the normal sense of that word. You have to come out afterwards to be able to contemplate it and understand what it is. And you will find 
that in that first jhana, there is something which uh, I've used an English word because I'm using similes from you know, my experience in our modern world to describe what it's like within these jhanas, and I've called it the wobble. Now, a wobble is when things shake slightly, like a jelly, so shaking slightly. And that is the meaning, in Pali, of vitaka vichara. Experiencing those states many times and understanding that wobble, then you reflect, why is there a wobble there? And why is that different from the second jhana? And my explanation is the most accurate which I can offer you, is that when you enter that first jhana, the object of your mind, if you ask yourself afterwards, what was I aware of? There's no nimitta there, no visual consciousness there at all. You're aware of a bliss, a piti sukha, not in two parts, one half piti, one half sukha, but a single bliss and a special type of bliss. However, even though you've let go a lot to get into that state, the mind, automatically, you're not doing this, not coming from a self, it's just the nature of the mind, often holds on to that bliss. It's so powerful, it does attract an attachment. You grasp it. And because any degree of effort makes these states unstable, the grasping of it, that's called the vichara, means that state is unstable. You either experience that as a bliss wobbling, or sometimes as if your mindfulness, your attention, your observer moving slightly away from that bliss. But then you get drawn straight back in again, because the bliss is far too attractive. It's like a super magnet which you cannot resist being drawn back in again. Being drawn back in again is the vitaka. So the holding on to it is the vichara. The Visuddhi Magga was accurate there, when it said it's just like hitting a gong in a resonance, or ho holding on to something. That's the vichara, that's the vitaka. But because the vichara, the holding on, is so slight, it's not strong enough to destroy the jhana completely. It just gives it the wobble, and that's a characteristic of the first jhana. It is still so close into that bliss that the other five senses are totally gone, which is an important thing to mention in these jhanas. I know that some other teachers say that you can experience sound, you can feel the body, or even you can think that you have chaitanya. But look, these jhanas are high states, they're not ordinary states. That is the jhana as I describe it. You have to be totally free of the five senses. You don't know what your body is up to. You're in the jitter, in the mind. And the bliss is that strong. There's no way that sound can really grab you. There's no way that the bodily pain can affect you. You're having the greatest time of your life, blissed out. And one of the interesting things, and the important things in these jhanas, because they're all states of extreme bliss, each jhana has a different flavour of bliss. Just like, and I'm giving sort of similes from the world, just as if there is strawberry ice cream, chocolate ice cream, um, vanilla ice cream. <laughs> yeah, they're all ice cream, but they've got slightly different flavours. And each of the blisses in the jhana have got different flavours. And the flavour is due to the cause of that bliss what's been let go of. Remember, these are stages of letting go. You don't attain these stages by wanting them, by letting go of many, 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 many things. This is just what happens when you let go. It's the result of not craving, the result of letting go. And the first jhana is the letting go of the body and the five senses. That's why it is blissful. And sometimes we don't realise how much dukkha is this body. Yes, you've got sickness, you know, it's cold, you know, you've sort of got aching knees, aching back, you're getting old and it's uh, tired, 
yeah, those are the ordinary sufferings. Yeah, you may have a great fever, you may have uh, an accident and have your leg taken off, but that's nothing compared to the real understanding of the suffering of this body. The reason is, you've had that suffering ever since you could remember. You got used to it, so you don't notice it anymore. It's just the common suffering of the five senses and the body. But when those five senses disappear, at last you are free. Teacher Ajahn, my teacher Ajahn Chah used to say, it's like the person, this is one of his similes, it's like a person who was born with a rope tied around their neck and two invisible demons pulling both ends of that rope. Now you've been born like that and the demons haven't let go of that rope since you were born. You've always had this tightness in your throat. You've got used to it and you take that for normal and you don't think there's any problem there. And one day, someone teaches you meditation and you get into a jhana and that rope is released. You never realise what breathing truly was, what happiness, what freedom truly was. Because an obstacle, a burden, an affliction, which was always there, has now gone. That's the bliss of the first jhana. You've all heard me and others and everybody else say just how delightful those jhanas are. But we don't just get into delight for the sake of delight, we understand why is that blissful. And it's because viviccha wakamehi. I know there's viviccha akusalehi damehi, but viviccha akusalehi damehi, that's the hindrances which are also a pain, but it's the five senses are the biggest pain and the body is a pain as well. And now you've seen that, you've got that. I'd say tomorrow just how that gives rise to huge insights. Experiential insights, not insights of thinking and using logic. Because logic can go both ways and it's not that convincing in the end. Experience is very convincing. But there you experience the bliss of being free from this body and the five senses. And you're there for long periods of time because it's a very stable bliss. Happinesses, joys, which are dependent upon material things, are very, very unstable. The joy of sex, the joy of food, the joy of watching cricket, or whatever else you find happiness within this world, is notoriously unstable. It comes and goes. Because it's born on attachment to things. When those things vanish, your happiness goes. The happiness of the jhanas, are born of letting go, renunciation. It doesn't depend upon things. It's just what happens when they're absent, when you free yourself from them. That's why it is far more stable. So you stay in there for a long period of time. The Piti Sukha congealed into just bliss. It is Vivekaja Piti Sukha. I think that's in the Potapada Sutta. Vivekaja means it's born, it's created, it's caused by the body and the five senses being absent. You've dropped them totally. What a relief. And you're free of them for a long period of time. They just can't interfere with you. One experience I had, I'm just, I'm only very careful because I'm not supposed to talk about my own deep experiences of jhanas, but look, there's one a time when I had typhus fever in hospital in the first or second year as a monk. And that was just so painful and just so tiring. You had zero energy. I remember just having to go to the toilet. This was a third world country, the monk's ward. Look, I remember when I went there, there was a, night, there was a nurse on at 6 p.m. The nurse left. We had just this ward. It was separate from all the other uh, wards. It was a monk's ward. The nurse left. By seven o'clock, eight o'clock, no replacement nurse had come. I asked the monk in the next bed, where's the night nurse? He said, there is no night nurse. You know, if something goes wrong in the middle of the night, it's just unlucky karma. So we weren't looked after at all. For 12 hours every day, we had no one looking after us. 
no emergency bells to ring, and we were really sick. So if something went wrong in the night, you were dead, and that was it. So we weren't given exactly you know, the sort of care I was used to. <laughs> and even there was no bedpans. So there was a toilet at the end of the ward, and if you did have lucky karma, your bed was close to the toilet. My bed was a long way away. And to get to a toilet, and this is no exaggeration, I remember this very clearly, you had to try and get up, no one was there to help you. Sometimes the monks would help you if one monk was fit, but most were as sick as I was. And you'd grab onto the railings of the bed to steady yourself, because you were like an old person, just so weak you could hardly stand. And then lurch, fall to the next bed and grab the rail so you didn't fall right over, and steady yourself, and use the rail to just manoeuvre to the end before you made your next sort of lurch, bed by bed, it was like climbing Mount Everest. And so when you did go to that toilet, you sat on there for an hour or more, because you didn't want to do this more than one or two times every day. And after three or four weeks of that, you just felt just so tired, painful, depressed. And so I decided, look, I'm a monk, I'm a meditator, come on, Baba Wangsa, stop you know, being a Nambi Pambi cream puff, as I say. Meditate. So just watch your breath, and he got into a deep meditation where you couldn't feel your body. Can you imagine how much of a relief that was for me? You know, to have half an hour or an hour, I think it was, having no aches, no pains, no weakness in your body, because it had gone, bye-bye body. <laughs> and that was just such a wonderful relief, to be able to do that, to let go of your body. This body is a huge pain. So if you can do that, marvellous. You get so much bliss, and that's the bliss. Born of letting go of the body. That's its cause, that gives it its flavour. So there you are, enjoying this incredibly powerful, blissful state. Again, the Ritaka Vichara has got nothing to do with thinking. Ritaka Vichara is used in other contents to mean thinking and pondering, but not in jhana. I'm just teaching from experience, but one of my friends, there's actually quite a lot of monks, uh, scholar monks, are now comparing the Chinese Agamas with the Buddhist suttas. Because if you know your history of Buddhism, the Chinese pilgrimage, pilgrims, the Buddhist pilgrims, went to India to collect as many ancient texts as they possibly could, and they translated those into Chinese. And it's the nature of the Chinese language that because they use ideograms, it's actually word-for-word -word translation. And so it's reasonably easy to translate back to the original Pali or Sanskrit, and get an accurate record of the text which they translated maybe 1800 years ago. And that's what makes it very interesting, because from the Chinese arguments, it's very simple, you don't even need to need, know Chinese now. One of my monks in Perth has got this program on the, on the uh, internet called Dr. I, which has got Chinese and English, you just press a button, you've got the Chinese text and it gives you an immediate translation. You don't need to be an expert. And what they noticed was whoever it was who translated those original suttas used a different ideogram for Vitaka Vichara for jhanas and Vitaka Vichara outside of jhanas. Whoever it was who did that translation knew that that word had a different meaning in the context of jhanas than in ordinary. Um, ordinary experience. And I think that each of you have had enough experience in meditation to know that thinking is coarse, it's disturbing, and it can't have any place in these refined jhanas. So I think you should understand from your own experience that there is no thinking in jhanas. An awareness, singleness, a kagata of perception, based on the bliss which is born of letting go of the body, of having no five senses. What happens next? If you don't just come out of that jhana, but because you stay there, because things are stable and still, things disappear. 
or using that other simile which I brought up earlier and now going to use again because it's very, very helpful to understand what's happening. The symbol of the lotus petals. Nimitta petals are open now and inside in the middle you've got a first jhana. You can't choose to go into a second jhana. You can't choose to come out of that jhana. You're stuck in there. Beautifully stuck. <laughs> A wonderful place to be stuck. What happens if you stay long enough? It opens out and in the middle of the first jhana you'll find the second jhana. It is a special case of the first jhana. It's right in the centre of the second jhana. But interestingly, those of you who know your suttas know that Sariputta described a state between the first and second jhana. Where there's vichara but no vitaka. And it should be quite obvious what that is now. That is where, yes, the first jhana, you, the mind holds on to the bliss a bit too strongly. And because of that it makes it unstable, so you move away. But you get attracted back again, which is the vitaka. As you settle down, you don't hold on so tightly. You are still holding on, but not enough to make the Piti Sukha unstable. Vichara, but the wobble is gone. Really, that state should belong to second jhana. It's almost the coarsest form of the second jhana. But nevertheless, Venal Sariputta, he called it a jhana in between first and second. From my experience, it belongs to second. But you can still see that there's a Vichara. You don't see this within the state, you reflect upon it afterwards. Holding, but it's not enough to disturb the state. But usually that just vichara just disappears, totally. And this is why that in that second jhana they call it sampasadana, ajatang sampasadana. Ajatang means you know, inside, sampasadana means like full confidence. Because to let go, you need confidence you'll find out that it's that trust, that faith, or that wisdom, which gives you the confidence, yet it's okay to let go. Even now, some of you think, if I keep doing this Ajahn Brahm method and letting go, my mind is going to go all over the place. Look, I should get my act together and just uh, exert my will. Get up early in the morning, just watch the breath. Come on, watch the breath. All this letting go business doesn't work. You've got no confidence. You're not giving it time. You interrupt, and even though some of you think you're letting go, you're not, you're still getting involved. Remember what I said, I think, yesterday, that friend who got into that fourth jhana and went to hospital. And when I asked him afterwards, what did you do? So you got into this state for the first time. And what he said, I've heard so many times. These days, uh, I ask a person when they get in the jhana the first time, what did you do that time? And I know what they're going to say. I really let go. I really let go. Totally let go. And I've heard that so many times that it really should be telling you something. The reason you don't get into jhana is because you're not really letting go. You're still getting involved in there. You're still controlling. You, your atta, is still running the show. You haven't let go. It's also why that once you become an Aryan, once you've seen that there is no self in there, it makes it much easier to get into jhanas. It's much easier to let go once you know there's no big boss inside you. So, there you are, just having a nice time in the jhanas, in the first jhana. And the opens up, because you can totally let go now, sampasadana, full confidence in the experience. And then you have the other flavour of Piti Sukha. The bliss which is born of Samadhi. Remember what I mentioned in the first evening, Samadhi, don't call it concentration, call it stillness. Now you are, for the first time ever in your experience, unless you've had a jhana before, second jhana before, you are still. Nothing is moving. Absolutely nothing. There's no wobble, it's a one-pointedness which lasts for long periods of time. 
And when you emerge afterwards, and you look back upon that state, because inside that state you just can't comprehend. You're mindful, but you can't comprehend what's happening. You haven't got the, the width of mind to see. Within that state, when you look upon it sort of afterwards, within that state, the feature which stands out most of all is the fact that it's perfectly still. Nothing is moving. And you can't even make it move. I'm going to mention tomorrow one of the most important insights which come from this. Is this is the first time your will, your doer, has totally disappeared. The first jhana has the bliss born of having the body disappear. The second jhana is the bliss of having your will disappear. If you contemplate that, after a while you will find that this thing called your will, your doer, your chooser, the thing you've been cherishing, all retreat, all life, all for many lives, is enemy number one. It's not to be cherished, it's not to be strengthened, it's to be abandoned. And now you've abandoned it, and now you see why. Why the Buddha taught letting go, not craving. Why the Buddha for six years before he became enlightened, tried, 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 got nowhere. When he learned how to just totally abandon and let go, as a path in, not just the jhanas, but into full enlightenment. To let go totally, until in Parinibbana, nothing left at all, gone fully. So there you are, the second jhana, having a wonderful time. Because it is more stable, it lasts much longer. So when people get into something like second jhana, they're meditating for hours, and you can't get them out. They're sitting there. That's where you have to lift them up and put them on the bus to take them back to Colombo. <laughs> they can't come out themselves. And they come out halfway on the journey. I was, I was in the retreat, where am I? <laughs> oh, we just put you in the bus. <laughs> but please, one thing, you know, if you see a monk emerging from a jhana, they've been sitting for hours, please be very gentle with them, because they've been in a very, very refined state. And don't go around talking to them, asking them questions, or even moving them. Because I remember Ajahn Chah said, it's like putting hot water into a cold glass. It won't destroy you or injure you, but it's very, very um, painful. You've just been into a very, very subtle, peaceful state, incredibly subtle state. So don't talk to them. I was very happy that there's one fellow in Perth who got into a jhana just in the Saturday afternoon sessions. And because I've been teaching this for such a long time, one of the people who saw him you know, I dragged the gong, we bowed, we asked all the questions, it all left, he was still sitting there. She waited for him, a couple of hours until he came out, and then gently led him to a quiet room, just to make sure the transition from the jhana back to his ordinary life wasn't a harsh one. You've got a very subtle mind oh, when you come out of jhana, and you don't want, you can't sort of relate to people in a normal way. So please be sensitive to yourself and sensitive to others if you see them just coming out of a jhana. And of course they're not interested in foods or cup or anything like that. They're just blissed out of their heads. They just, <laughs> just want to come down a bit. But later on I'll say that what individually you should do is just reflect on what's happened. Use their experience as a source of reflection. And you get some great insights from that which I'll tell you later. So there you are in the second jhana, and sometimes, just like the lotus, it opens out into a third jhana. Just the piti sukha gets even more refined, so much so that half of it vanishes. And again, a strange experience, the only thing you can say is there, it was like a second jhana, the mind was not moving, perfectly still, only the, the bliss changed to a much more refined happiness. And it's weird because if you get into a first jhana, you think that must be the ultimate happiness. It can't take more bliss than this. 
but then it changes and you get into a second jhana, you realize there's a far more refined bliss than the bliss of the first jhana. When I mentioned a few days ago that sometimes Christians in the Middle Ages, not these days, but some of those Middle Aged Christians, people like St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, you know that she was recorded as levitating, this Christian saint, but they can't do it these days, they've lost their simplicity of lifestyle and renunciation. When they got into these states, and to me, when I was reading what they said, it looks like a first jhana, they called it union with God. Absolute bliss, pure love, ecstasy, and they became saints. For anyone who can attain jhanas, if you were a Christian, they would name a school, a church, a hospital after you. <laughs> we would get Metawihari General Hospital. Sorry, Saint Metawihari <laughs> School. <laughs> not St. Joseph's, not St. Andrew's, but St. Metawihari. <laughs> and this is how huge they are, incredible blisses. But, you find that that bliss is not the end. That there's a bliss higher than that, more refined. That becomes the second jhana. The second jhana, it changes another type of bliss, which is more high, more refined. And when you look back afterwards, you realize that half of what you took to be bliss has now vanished, the pity part. And look, I can't explain what that pity is like, because these, it, it goes beyond my ability to explain. The Buddha was brilliant, but I'm not up to that standard. Pity, half of bliss is gone. And now, because you know that what's left, and you know what's gone, now you can understand what pity is. Pity and sukha are like these two twins. They're inseparable. Wherever you see them during this world, during your life, they're always together, always together. So much so that you think they're just one being. And now half of them has disappeared. For the first time, you know what sukha is, you know what pity is. So I tell people, you can't distinguish those two until you've had a third jhana experience. And then, of course, it gets even more stable, and the sukha disappears. Or rather, that particular type of sukha, of third jhana, until you get to the fourth, which is pure stillness and equanimity, an even more refined state. But of course, that is still sukha, just a different type of happiness. It's really incredible, just the different types of happiness you have. This is even more happiness because you see the affliction of the ordinary type of sukha. Now it's a more refined sukha. And if you carry on, you just go into the arupas. What's happening with the four jhanas is will is disappearing. And the third and fourth jhana is just the effect, if you like, the echo of the disappearance of the will of the doer. So in the fourth jhana, totally still, equanimous, this doer has gone. The arupa states, these are where another thing happens. The knower is disappearing, consciousness is vanishing which again is weird. How it happens, and again this is very difficult to explain, but because people want to understand something about these states, you try an explanation. Now that first Arupa state is usually in English called the, infin the infinity of consciousness. So infinity of space, sorry. The, what's that called? The Akazanantaya. Akaz Anand Ayatana. Yeah. Sometimes I found it hard to pronounce. <laughs> but the Ananta, instead of infinite, it's without an end, without a boundary, without a limit, without anything to circumscribe it. And in order to let people understand what that means in experience, I refer meditators back to an early stage of your meditation, present moment awareness. And I do this because most of you have this experience. You can understand from examining what happens when you get into present moment, understanding what it means to have this unlimited or unbounded space. Because in the present moment, once you get your attention, 
firmly focused in the present moment. There is no time. Past and future have vanished. And all time is, is a measure. A measure between the past and the present, the present and the future, or the past and the future. When there's no past, when there's no future, there's no way of measuring time. Really, you're squashed so much there is no time at all. But you experience that as an infinity of time. You have all the time in the world. At the same time, no time. Time is not bound. You can actually call present moment awareness kalanantayatana, the space of unbounded time, the, the uh, field, the ayatana, of unbounded, unsubscribed, un, uh, time without edges. Now, if you get to understand that, you understand what happens in the fifth, in the fifth jhana, as sometimes they call it. There, space, extent, has no more meaning. That part of consciousness, which could measure extension, has gone. And all that's left is, again, consciousness. Consciousness is just aware of consciousness. Until you get unbounded consciousness. What's happening here, just like in the present moment, time is about to disappear. Which is why people can meditate for long periods of time. And you haven't fallen asleep. You take two hours, three hours, I can only meditate 40 minutes, you've been perfectly aware, but time has lost its meaning. Space loses its meaning in the fifth. Consciousness loses its meaning in the sixth. It's beginning to disappear. When it does disappear, what you're aware of is nothing. Consciousness and space, the things which the mind can be aware of, have vanished. The object has gone, but you're still aware of that object. In the disappearance of consciousness, the object goes first, and the observer goes next. So then, you're observing nothing, but you're observing that nothing. So the observer vanishes. But you can observe that observer vanishing. You perceive it. If you look at it from this state, yeah, you're perceiving, there's no perceiver. From the object state, there's nothing being perceived. That is the best way I can describe neither perception or non-perception. It's the last moment before consciousness stops. The mind ceases. It's called, was it Sanya Vediyati Naroda? The cessation of all perception, feeling, and also consciousness. Because of stillness, not just the knower, not just the will, but the observer has vanished. Your mind has ceased. Everything has stopped. When you come out of that state afterwards, you realize this thing which, in the fourth jhanas, if you're smart enough, if you're not stupid, you can see that this doer cannot be anything to do with me. I am not the one who chooses. Chaitanya is just cause and conditions, nothing to do with me. She goes through the Arupas, the observer, the one which is looking at me right now, the one which hears this, the one which feels, vanishes. It's subject to cessation. It can stop. It's not permanent. You've experienced it stopping. That gives you the data, the information, which is irresistible to see the truth, to see what the Buddha saw, to see anatta, not through theory, not through belief, but through experience. But I'll go in more into that later on. These are the jhanas and the arupas. I went quickly through the arupas because the deeper you get, it is so hard to describe because they're very, very refined states which have almost no connection, no similarities with this world of karma loka. That's why when the Buddha described these states, you know, that's why you just, you know, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. But the Buddha was an incredibly powerful teacher. Not just experience, but could describe it in such a way that no one will ever be able to improve upon. I just 
try and add a few features on the edges. But the Buddha gave the great descriptions. So that's what happens with the jhanas. That's what it feels like. The deeper you go, the longer you stay. But, for those of you who have important things to do, like catch planes, what you do, once you get into a few jhanas, let them go as long as they like. To hell with lunch, to hell with catching planes, or whatever else you have to do in life. Enjoy to the max. They're important. Many lifetimes you've waited for this. So don't worry about anything. Just sit there and let people put you on the bus or just carry you to your room and leave you there for days. Well, I can't resist this story. But uh, somebody told me recently that there was a Vietnamese monk who was teaching a retreat like we're teaching here in Australia. The monk who told me this would not tell me this monk's name. And I'm glad he didn't because you don't want monks to become famous and become sort of like rock stars. But the clock and the talk was about to begin, but the monk hadn't opened his eyes yet, he was still meditating. Half past eight, nine o'clock, the monk was still meditating. Nine thirty, he hadn't opened his eyes. Ten o'clock, the lay people thought there's going to be no talk tonight, so they all went to bed. When they got up in the morning, the monk was still sitting there, hadn't moved. He didn't move for eight days. He just sat there. Not seven days, it was eight days. He didn't move, didn't go to the toilet didn't open his eyes, didn't drink, just sat there. He didn't give any talks. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the eight days when he came out of his meditation, he apologised. He said, I'm so sorry I never gave any talks. And all the laborers said, no, no, sadhu, sadhu, anamada. It's so wonderful to see that monks can still do that these days. He said that was so inspiring to see that's still possible. So that's what happens sometimes, you just get in there and you just can't come out, you have a wonderful time, days come, days go. But, if you, what he should have done, he, he was right to apologise, because if he was really skilled in meditation, what you do is you do Adhisthana. I already mentioned that programming mindfulness at Adhisthana is very powerful the deeper you get. You just say, I'll enter the jhana for two hours or three hours or even half an hour. Half an hour is not really much. You give that determination, and it's incredible how well it works. You just come out at the right time. So if you do start to develop the jhanas, and you do have responsibilities, remember to add Itana when you're going to come out. So remember this retreat is finishing on Sunday. What time does the bus leave to go back to Colombo? <laughs> we haven't booked the bus. Though. We haven't booked the bus, okay. <laughs> But once we got the bus, book the bus, we'll tell you, make the Adistar to come out before the bus leaves. <laughs> okay, so that is a talk about jhanas. I think I've gone on a bit, oh no, just nine o'clock, which is good. Because you, know, you have to translate it afterwards. And I hope it inspires you. I hope it describes what these states are and how just one progresses from the other. Opening of the lotus, you don't come out of first jhana and then go into a second jhana. You don't come out of fourth and then try and get into third. These are progressive states, deeper and deeper states of stillness. That's how they work. And as you come out, you have to come out in reverse order. Sometimes very quickly, but still, if you're in fourth jhana, you have to go through third, second and first to come out. You can't do that, just as the mind starts to move again. That's just the way it happens. While you're in there, you can't know what's going on. Afterwards, you reflect, and you understand what these jhanas are and how powerful they are. And enjoy them. They're well worth it. Thank you for listening.